Right, hi again. So this is uh, Unit 11, which I'd promised you and I finally get a chance to actually record. Um, and it's going to focus on theory, but also I'm going to insert a little bit of information about disseminating research findings, uh, something which we'd not had time to, to actually finish when we're together. Uh, so we will look at the changing notion of disseminating findings. That's one of the objectives. And the second one is to introduce you to the importance of, of theory. As I've explained, this is a bit artificial for reasons that are um, the faculty's own. We have decided to um, not talk about theory in, in introduction to research. And then you have the, the theory course comes in much later. It would make sense to have the theory course come first because, as I've explained, it actually uh, feeds and informs uh, the rest of your choices, but it's thought to be too complicated and therefore it would put you off as a first course. So it's artificially reversed in terms of process, but I think it's still important as we wrap up that you have a bit of an intro on theory so that you're not, um, you're not sort of at last as to where it fits. So one thing I want you to, to mention is that now that you've learned how to do a critical review of a journal article, you should consider doing a book review, not not now during the summer, obviously, uh, but later on, because it is fairly similar to the work that you've done for the critical review of a journal article, except you do it for the whole book. So what's what, why and what's the advantage? Well, you are graduate students and you are trying to establish yourself as scholars. And for many scholars, the first thing they publish is a book review. It's not that hard. It's in great demand because journal articles always want to have the, you know, a book review and they're missing reviewers. Um, and it's a good job for a graduate students to do. So before you finish a grad, your, your, your master's, I really recommend that you do that. Uh, it was, I was advised to do so when I was a master's student and I took the uh, advice and then I, I did get published at the end of my first year of my, uh, of my master's. And I think it really makes you feel more confident. It's, it actually counts as a publication, right? Just as much as if you'd done a study. Um, and it's something that's a lot of work, but it's a lot less work than doing your own research and doing your own uh, sort of uh, study. So it's a good way to get your name out there. It's a good way to gain uh, confidence. And also journals are in great need. So there's always, I've given you a few links there. I hope they still work. I haven't tried them. Um, but otherwise, just Google, uh, you know, call for reviews, book reviews, uh, journal in education, and you're going to find lots of different journals that are looking for reviews. Um, so the way it works is normally you can, there's the three different ways. Either you find a book that you really like and you get it from a library and you review it and you send the review to the journal, or normally you contact them and ask whether they are looking for reviews. And if they do, they will send you the book free and then you send them back the review. Normally the time frame is about three months. It's not super rushed. Uh, and then sometimes um, they will contact, but that's less likely for you, but sometimes they'll contact you with a specific request. So they could contact me, for example, and say, would you like to review this book? But that's less likely to happen with you. Um, but certainly contacting uh, these uh, general articles uh, and asking them if there's a need for books to be reviewed, you will, be, you will see they will tell you as there is and they'll send you one. Um, so it's a good exercise to do, and it fits well within the objectives of uh, 6110 as a course. So I wanted to mention it because it's a natural continuation that you can do at a later stage in your in your program. Uh, I wanted to talk about disseminations a little bit because it's, a, it's, a, it's changing, and I wanted you to be aware of the fact that it's changing and how that affects your reflection around um, just the whole scientific process. So you know, we make it look almost like uh, you do your research question as you've done in this course, you develop your study, then you publish, then then you look for a journal, but that's not always the case. And I wanted you to, to be aware of the practicalities of it. Often researchers will actually be, they will know where they're publishing before they start. And that has a lot of impact on the research question as well. Um, so sometimes we have what I call habitual journals. So journals that you, we know they're interested in your work and they're likely to take you. So vice versa it means that we're going to frame our studies to fit that journal because we've got a relationship with them and we know that they they take us but journals have themes formatting etiquette methodological inclinations theoretical preference so we know what they want so often we design the research question in light of what they want because we want to get published right just wanted to be honest and let you know that that's often how it worked um Journals, I say, also like authors to reference their own work. So they like to reference other things that have already been published by the journal. So when you're writing, in particular when you're doing your lit review, often you know which journal you're going to publish with, and you're already making sure that there's an awful lot of references that come from that journal. 
because you already are writing for that uh, publication. You know that's where you're going to send it, right? So it, it also frames your, your literature review. Um, there's also things that are called um, special issues, and that's even more targeted. So often a journal will have a special issue on a special theme. So it could be, for example, um, technology in students uh, with learning disabilities. Um, and the, the journal wants, uh, has sent a call out for people to send articles that fit that bill. But what happens often is that we don't have a study of the field bill, we create a study of the field bill. So the calls come out a long time in advance and often we see the call and think, oh, I could do something like that. So your research question in these cases are really targeted specifically to the issue. And why do we do that? Because obviously, it's a quick process and they are looking for a very specific topics. So if you fit the topic, you're much more likely to get published. So all this to say that, you know, the process which we are modeling for you of uh, what could be a question, how do I design my question? I'm thinking about my audience, but I then choose my methodology and, and so forth is, is, is what we do. But in practice, it's shaped a lot more by the end product and where we are going to be published. So the dissemination is important in, in even how you frame your questions or what you research. And that's the, that's the, the reality of it. So you need to know, you need to know what, what happens in the field. Um, and then we talked about target audience, right? We've said that right through. So just to remind you, I kept talking to you about who's the stakeholder and who's the stakeholder um, because it's at the heart of the design question. You write for someone to read you. Um, I said there's nothing worse than research that's never read by anyone because that means that it's not relevant to anyone. So as I mentioned, but this is not surprising because I mentioned right through, it, it, it deals with the dissemination too. As you create your question, you're thinking who might want to be reading this. And so very much you're targeting your question to a potential readership. Uh, so always keep the reader in mind firmly as you draft the proposal and write the article. I think I've insisted on that, but I just wanted to uh, to come back to it because that's the end of the process. That's why I asked you at the beginning, who's the stakeholder? Because when you can you come to the dissemination, that's who's going to read it. So that's who it's going to go to. Now, the way it has changed, uh, it's uh, so, in, so I'm going to talk about journals first. So all not, pub, not all publications are equal. Uh, there's a ranking in the journal. So when you come to actually disseminating and, and publishing, you also are looking at, um, you know, the best outlets or the not so great outlets. So if you look in Johnson, remember it's that book, Open Access, which I told you was a good read and, and really great for, for young career or early career as sort of scholars. Uh, he explains the ranking and he explains all that. Um, and when you begin, you want, so you often you have a, a compromise to do. You'd like to be in the best possible journals, but they might not take you. So sometimes you lower your expectations, go for a journal that's not ranked as high because you want to make sure that you're published. Um, they are also non-peer reviewed publications, but they don't, um, they don't, uh, obviously they're not ranked. And it's still, I mean, I've had quite a few um, pieces published in non-peer reviewed publication. As you begin your career, it's a, it's a way to still get published, right? And, and if you, you know, quick, it's a quick process. And if you're not sure of whether it's going to get into one of the big journals, at least you get published and still in your CV. Uh, you also can uh, disseminate research findings in conference proceedings which are not double blind reviews usually, they just uh, just submitted to the editor and the editor you know, edits them and reviews them. So it's not as hard to get into them, but it's still kinds of publication. And so a lot of people will choose to publish through a conference proceedings instead of a, a proper journal. Um, so also think of uh, presenting at conferences, graduate students really, uh, should try and publish, uh, uh, you know, uh, or get to a conference and, and, and present at a conference um, before the end of their, of their MA, uh, of their MED, and, uh, and then you might have a chance to, to also um, submit to the conference proceedings. The great thing with conference proceedings and conferences is that it doesn't have to be original research. Um, it's easy enough to, to, to do a piece on, you know, your, your, your professional sort of experience, uh, the way you're looking back at your career and experiences you've had in your career. It doesn't have to be hard data. Uh, it could be reflective pieces and you could still get into a conference and you could still get it published. So important to, to think of that as in this term of your, of your career as young, as young graduate students uh, who are looking to take that next step. Uh, it, the way in dissemination has changed is also that now it's your job to go beyond the publication. I talked to you a little bit about it, but um, Johnson has a good chapter about it too. 
it's not just about publishing your finding in the publication. It's your job then to take the publication and to actually give it visibility. So you're given normally complementary initial issues, which you can share with people to create a buzz. Um, you, they give you a link that you can use through social media, such as Twitter, Academia Edu, and LinkedIn. And it's your job to sell, basically. It's your job to get out there and make sure that it's read and that you connect to the people that it might be relevant to and that that piece has visibility. So again, that's the new angle on dissemination. It's not just the publisher's job. It becomes your job. It's your job to have a profile, your job to have visibility, and your job to make sure that the findings actually reach the people that they're going to be relevant to. So it was interesting. It was important to finish on that. Um, I also want to talk about theory. So I don't want to get too much into it, but I do want to, um, to, to talk about the theory a little bit. So what is theory? And when you start that course 6114, you're going to be, um, you know, sort of bombarded with information, pretty hard text. But in the end, it's not that complicated to explain theory. I compare it to a pair of sunglasses. It's a lens. It's a lens that you put on, and because you put it on, you see with a different contrast things that you would not otherwise see. And because you put the lens on, and because you have this different vision, you're able to identify what you are looking at in terms of phenomena, you, what you'd like to, to be interested in. It enables you to choose your phenomena, choose your research question, choose your, the choose your methodology and your tools and to follow the whole process. So that's why it's important to finish with this because we made an abstraction of it in terms of, uh, of keeping it simple, but really we should have started with it because the theory is the first thing you adopt. And because you adopt the theory, then you, uh, you, you have a clear choice of methodology and so forth and so on. So that's the first step is this, the, the, the lens. You put the glasses on, you see the problem, you see what's going to fit. So it's, it's, a, it's a vision that the theory then gives you and it enables you to make all the appropriate choices afterwards. So that first choice informs all the other choices. Uh, so it's really important that you, you remember this as we finish the course, that there was a piece missing there, and that's the theory, and that's where it should have been. It should have been the beginning, not at the end. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of 614 as well, and particularly because the landscape is so complicated and because there are so many hundreds of theories, where do you start? So when I teach 614, I'm teaching it now, um, I always said it's important to have some sort of compass to find your way. And because there are hundreds of theories, how do you find your way? So a few authors, and I, I'm, I, I'm one of them, um, argue that there's really four theories that are going to articulate your world. There are four theories that are serving as your compass that you can always go back to. And I am, and you've got an, uh, an, a chapter from Brunton and Rhodes, which gives you a nice breakdown of these four theories. So you can go back to that. I'm going to explain them now, but you can go back to that to uh, get more detail. So what are these four theories? I've listed them there for you. Positivism, phenomenology, critical theory, and postmodern thought. And as you go into 614, if you have an understanding of that, you'll be able to find your way through this greatly great complex landscape that you're going to be confronted with so i'm going to give you just just in a nutshell just enough information for you as you finish that you keep that in your mind and you're able to carry that with you into 614 because there really are these sort of four compass points that are, you're going to be able to relate anything that you find back to these four theories so what is positivism? Positivism is the, the theory on science which you're most familiar with because it's the one that you encounter in public uh, perceptions of theory of, of science and, and in, in, in the in sort of cultural representations as well. Um, it's the theory that underpins all of our natural sciences and, uh, and all of our sort of pure sciences. So it's this notion that there's one universal reality and we are getting there slowly, right? So we we are taking little steps, as I said to you at the beginning, using the matrix and the Play-Doh cave. We may never get quite there because we are limited by our senses and our perceptions, but we are getting closer and closer to this one sort of um, universal sort of uh, valid view of the of the world. So for positivists, there's only one reality and that makes sense right because if you build bridges you're not going to tell me there's different laws of physics there's one law of physics so it works well for natural and the natural world and natural sciences uh, the world that surrounds us but um but social scientists have argued and that's we're getting to the second one now that when we look at social phenomena we look at interaction of people it's not the case that there isn't one reality. There are, in fact, many subjective reality, and that's what phenomenology argues. 
Um, so it's it, it, it phenomenology builds itself as an opposition to um, to positivism. It, it may shock you if we say that there are many different realities, but think of uh, of a process where you're looking at something happening in the class. Something happening in the class is going to be lived completely differently from a student perspective, from a teacher perspective, or from a parent or community perspective. Each of these realities on on the phenomena such as the integration of technology is going to be rich and pertinent it's going to represent someone's lived experience of that phenomena so it, ha it, it it's going to have a, it's going to be a reality that is worth exploring but it's going to be a subjective reality and it's not going to be the same reality depending on which stakeholder you're looking at so that's what phenomenology is it's about exploring the lived experience of people to be able to identify the way they construct meaning and that is not universal, that is subjective. But it's still it's still important to explore for us because we work in social sciences. And so the things that we do in the classroom, the way we reform the classroom, the way we um, try to understand what happens in the classroom, often is going to be explained by these subjective realities, not by great big universal principles of natural sciences. So I'm going to leave it there. It's enough for you to understand. Um, it does mean that phenomenology is going to be interested in people's discourse, people's storytelling, because through the storytelling, we're going to be able to actually get to um, to their lived experience and the articulations of their lived experience and the way they create meaning. The third one, so these two are opposed to each other. The third one stands alone. It's not really bothered by the other two. It's critical theory. So critical theory is inherently political. It's a political framework for, for, for looking at, at theory and at the world and at research. Um, critical theory is, is Marxist, so it comes from, you know, from uh, sometimes we call it the School of Frankfurt, from a group of thinkers that started in 1930 in Frankfurt in Germany, and that really are essentially Marxist, so they, they're inspired by Marx. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a radical political movement, but it really wants to change the world, and it argues that research is only valid if it changes the world. Uh, in more detail, they argue that um, the world is structured by inequitable power dynamics, so that there are people who have things and people who don't, and that everywhere we look, we are going to see that. So they argue that the role of researchers is to identify these inequitable power dynamics and then to rectify them. So it's a, it's it's engaged um, research. It's it's not for the sake of researching. We're researching because we want to identify these inequities and we want to resolve them. So in, within the course of 614, you'll go into more details about how they do that. But it's always research that takes you back to these inequities and the desire to change these inequities. That's always going to be the focus of critical theory. That's the worldview that it offers you. That's the vision that it offers you. So when I talk about the sunglasses, if you put critical theory on, that's what you're going to be focusing on. That's the, that It's going to lead you into these phenomena and these problems. And then we have the tough one, the last one, postmodern thought. I'm going to try to explain it to you in, in a few sentences. It's complicated. You may actually be looking at postmodern thought for the rest of your life. It's not um, super easy to, to get to, but I'm going to try and explain it to you in a, in a, in a nutshell. So postmodern thoughts, most of the original thinkers in postmodern thought were linguists, and it's important to go back to, to the notion of language to be able to understand it. They are mostly French. In 1950s, uh, linguists who studied questioning and understanding of language. Up till then, it had been very um, clear or simple. People thought that um, language was a matter of looking at a word and an object, and with every object, there was a word. These linguists in the 50s started, um, you know, from a communication studies perspective, challenging that and saying, in fact, it's much more complicated than that. And they started going about signifier and signified. The word is the signifier, the object is the signified. They started arguing that actually the relationship between these two things is much, much more complicated than we think. A good example to show you what they mean is the way we teach kids how to speak. So if you have the signified, which is chair, the signifier, sorry, which is chair, the word chair, and the signified, which is the object that the kid sees, the baby. As you teach a baby language, you're going to point to the chair and you're going to say chair. So you're connecting the signified to the signifier. But ling these linguists argue that actually in communications, most linguists in communication studies they argue this, that in fact, it is not a direct link that you're creating between the two. The baby at one point will see a chair that doesn't look like a chair. I might go to the doctors and see a 
a stool it has three legs, not four. It doesn't have a back, but it's still going to identify that as a chair. So it's the baby starts understanding that actually the signifier which you're giving them is a, a concept. It's not a direct connection to an object. Okay, it's good so far. So this is the really sort of huge discovery which they did in the 50s and started articulating as studies of language in this way. But some of them went further than that, particularly a gentleman called uh, Roland Barthes, so he's a French uh, writer, B-A-R-T-H-E-S. Um, and he started arguing that, um, that this signifier doesn't just carry a concept, but it carries values. So I'll give you an example uh, of, of what he uh, uses to explain that, and then, then, we'll, and then we'll get very quickly to it, and then we'll stop there, because you'll have enough understanding to understand postmodern thought. So he's French, so he takes the example in a book called Myths. He, um, yeah, I can't remember it's myth or mythologies in, in French or in English, which, whichever way it's been translated, but something like myth or mythologies in, in each of either language. Um, so he's French, so he takes the example of um, the bottle of red wine. So imagine you go into someone's party and you bring a bottle of red wine. So he says, well, you've got this term, bottle of red wine, that's a signifier. The signified is a glass container with fermented grape juice. He says that when you bring a bottle of red wine, you're not bringing the signifier, the signified, you're bringing a concept. And he says that is not just a concept of that is wider than the object so the signifier is wider than the signified but he said that the signifier in itself carries connotation carries symbolism and for him for example in that example he says that if you bring a bottle of red wine to someone's home you actually are using a symbol of luxury good taste and he argues belonging to the middle class what he calls the bourgeoisie right that that's that object shows you that you belong to that club so he argues that the signifier is much wider than the object. And, and, and more than that, it's like a key to get into a group. And he says it's a key to get into a group because it carries inherent connotations and symbols. That's basically what postmodernism is. Once you understand that, you understand postmodern thought. So they are going to say that some of the concepts that we use carry symbols carry connotations they push that a little further and they're going to say that what we have with language are cultural representations and they're going to say that these cultural representations that are carried by by language have nothing to do with reality and so postmoderns are going to be obsessed about deconstructing deconstructing language they're going to say all that all these words that we have all these notions and concepts that we have we have to deconstruct them to be able to get to the real meaning which is behind. And often the real meaning which is behind is very different than the meaning that, that is carried by these cultural representations. So an example I often give is that if you take the example of full postmodern reflection on, on knowledge, if you take the example of, of universities, if you ask most people, what are the connotations that come to mind when you think of universities? People will say higher level le learning, higher learning, um, tradition, history, uh, research, postmoderns are going to say these are cultural representations that are carried by language. They're carried by that very word and its association, but that the reality isn't that. And postmoderns are going to say if you deconstruct all that, what you have behind is a business. And it's a business like, yeah, like, like your corner shop on a different scale, doing different things, but it really has the same mechanisms. It's actually primarily a business. So here you see a typical postmodern reflection. So you take the language, you take these concepts, you analyze them, you deconstruct them, and then you say, actually, the reality by that isn't that. And so they argue that that's the point of research, that it's a constant destructuring of these things that otherwise get carried by language because it separates us from reality. And if you want knowledge, you have to go beyond this and you have to dissect them to get to reality as it is. On that note, I'm going to leave you there and, and finish there. Um, with that, you have really a, a great compass to go into the 614 course when eventually you go into it. And remember that that theoretical reflection comes at the beginning of this process that we've described through this course. That's where it should have been. It isn't because it's just um, sort of fictionally in a different place because of the way the masses has been organized. But really, we should have spent a lot of time talking about the before we even started talking about methodologies. So it's important that you have that firmly in mind as we finish the course. Okay, bye for now. And I will be posting more things during the week. Bye.